Hello audience, Mr. Z here, and today we've got a sponsorship from Total Battle, a real-time overhead strategy game where you can build your army and your little civilization, then go either on the offensive or defensive to face off against others. If you're interested, there's a link in the description that'll take you right to the site. So with that out of the way, let's get right into this. World War III. It's been a subject of mass concern since the early 50s, and we all generally associate such conflict as ending in total nuclear annihilation. People have often imagined such a deadly exchange being triggered by the gradual degrading of U.S.-Soviet relations, or by a large overstepping of boundaries by other sides, such as in the Cuban Missile and Suez Crises. However, there was a point in the mid-70s when such an outcome could have been initiated by the simple cutting down of a tree. This was the Poplar Tree Incident. Korea, 1976. In an attempt to improve line of sight from a local outpost, a small number of American and South Korean troops and officers decided to chop down a stray tree which was obscuring their view across the joint security area within the DMZ, a strip of territory separating North Korea from South Korea. The team would approach the tree and begin cutting only to be met with a force of North Koreans who would observe the cutting until abruptly ordering them to stop their cutting as the tree was planted by Kim Il-sung himself and of significant importance to the North Koreans. This made no difference to the South Koreans and Americans, of course, who continued cutting, until the North Koreans retaliated violently, beating the team and even using their own axes against them, killing two American officers and setting in motion the orchestration of Operation Paul Bunyan, which, simply put, was a plan to remove the tree by any means necessary. In totality, there was the mobilization of some 20 armed vehicles, a large number of South Korean special forces armed with mines, a number of attack helicopters, multiple nuclear-ready bombers, a small garrison of soldiers armed with rifles and chainsaws, as well as the USS Midway just offshore. In their own show of force, a number of North Korean soldiers began setting up machine-gunning posts aimed at the American forces while they cut down the tree. Miraculously, no shots were fired, and what could have been a mass catastrophe, was avoided. However, what if that wasn't the case? What if upon felling the tree, the North Korean soldiers opened fire upon the Americans and South Koreans? This very scenario was of heavy concern to all parties even partially involved. Neither the Soviets, the Chinese, Americans, and Koreans wanted the situation to escalate, yet all feared that it would, and were certainly prepared to act in just such an event. And while I doubt this would trigger nuclear retaliation by either side, despite the nuclear-ready American bombers, I do believe it would have led to a conflict which could have triggered such a cataclysm had proper action not been taken, as we'd be looking at something which could very well restore anti-Western sentiment in the East during what was in our timeline a very important period of reproachment. We ought to take into consideration two things, one of which was that the South Korean president, Park Chung-hee, did not wish any military action to be taken and the American president at the time, Gerald Ford, had taken great effort for this to not escalate things further, thus making it unlikely for the Americans to fire the first shot. However, readiness levels were raised to DEFCON 3, which, in case that has no meaning to you, means that the US was gearing up for potential nuclear war. So, it all boils down to what if those North Korean machine gunners fired upon the tree cutters. Perhaps there's an increased tension in the air, both sides fear the other is just waiting for their opportunity to attack. And for whatever reason, shots are fired. The US and South Korean forces retaliate, and the demilitarized zone explodes into chaos. The Korean War would gradually reignite, and by this point, the Koreans still have the support of the Soviets, and such a conflict will no doubt catch the attention of neighboring China. The North Koreans launch an all-out assault with the goal of unifying the Korean Peninsula under a communist flag by force. Such a declaration would need to be met with military retaliation by the US and South Korea. Escalation by this point had become unavoidable. Immediately, local American forces which had been readied in the area would unleash their aerial bombardment whilst naval forces awaited for the orders off the coast. The Chinese would send in troops to support the Korean War effort after feeling as though American aggression within Asia had been reignited, while the Soviets financially supported the Koreans with money, supplies, and weaponry. This conflict would dissolve all progress that was made by the US and communist powers toward coexistence and would lead to a gradual restoration of Sino-Soviet relations after their split. It's interesting to note that by this point in time, North Korea had become disillusioned with China's approach to communism, just as China had previously become disillusioned with the Soviets' approach to communism. However, given the rather hasty manner in which tensions had reignited, the Chinese were drawn in as a means to defend Asia from Western aggression, and in turn the Soviets would be drawn in to secure what was their advantage of a communist-dominated Asia, all putting aside their differences and remembering who their shared foe was. Communist exile would rise across China and the Soviet Union as to begin a reproachment campaign for the establishment of a single communist bloc. The US would not want another Vietnam on its hands, however, as the war progressed, it seemed that is what it was becoming. 
Gerald Ford would only see the war's beginnings and not have much say in the matter, and unfortunately it would be the timid Jimmy Carter who inherits this conflict. No doubt Carter would hope to end the conflict quickly, however this would make Carter and the nation as a whole appear weak to American allies, and as if they were abandoning South Korea and even Japan. The communists had rebounded and he could not let the Soviets have this victory. Still, Carter would make numerous attempts to resolve the conflict diplomatically, going as far as to grant the North's claim to the entire peninsula so long as South Korean citizens could be migrated to Japan. But such talks would almost always resolve in the demand for all of Korea and the Korean citizens, Kim Il-sung even asserting that Japan pay its dues for its imperialist actions in the past. President Carter would be forced to send in soldiers in order to defend South Korea and Japan, as once again, following the demilitarization of Japan, the US swore to protect it from any and all threats. A number of fortifications are established along the North and South Korean border, from which American forces would hold back the North. This would prove to be quite an effective strategy, as American soldiers in the South were able to hold their ground within their new fortifications, and could receive a steady supply of resources and weaponry from the US through Japan and up the peninsula. However, this system would not address how the US would take back land lost to the North, who was, despite the South's endurance, pressing on and refusing to back down. Eventually, the North would advance, but the South had no way of pushing back, only holding their territory as long as they could. This would be the cycle of war for the next few years. Carter would oversee the slow and gradual loss of ground to the North Koreans throughout his administration. He was growing increasingly unpopular, and while the Vietnam War saw protests calling for the war's end, the Second Korean War would see yells for action. It was clear Carter was taking the defensive approach, and it was apparent to all who could see it that it wasn't working. Carter's popularity was plummeting, and it'd be then that Ronald Reagan takes the chair building his campaign around the restoration of American dominance and an assured victory in the Second Korean War, characterizing himself as an American strongman who would defeat the communists by any means necessary. Reagan's first act would be the unification of South Korea and Japan into a united force, pushing for a rapid remilitarization of the Japanese Empire and beginning an unrestricted bombing campaign against the North Korean forces cutting into the peninsula's borders from both ends to cut off all incoming aid from China. The tables would turn quickly for the communists, however South Korean forces were dwindling and likely wouldn't hold out much longer. But this was more than just a strategic victory for Reagan. This was a demonstration of what happens when you cross the US of A, and that our forces best not be trifled with, that things were going to finally change and he'd be the one to change them. Reagan would take things a step further as rumors began circulating within communist circles that nuclear weapons were being developed and readied within Japan, despite their non-nuclear principles. But it was becoming quickly clear that things had changed. The US was reviving the Japanese Empire into a force for the West, and even in the absence of the Japanese nukes, their military was quickly shaping up into a formidable force, eager to tear into the North Korean front. With the support of the reinvigorated Japanese military, the US and remnant South Korean army would lead a spearhead push into the peninsula after having cut off the border between China and Korea with chemical agents, making the region uninhabitable. The Japanese were promised right to oversee reconstruction of the peninsula post-war so long as they maintained their allegiance to the US, in essence, returning Korea to a state of Japanese occupation. With the added advantage of the Korean military being exhausted and nearly annihilated, Japan would basically have full right over the territory. The Second Korean War would end in 1982 with an absolute victory and the Koreas being completely assimilated into the new Japanese Empire. The Soviets would press Reagan about the existence of nukes within Japan, creating what was in essence another Cuban Missile Crisis, one which Reagan would once again utilize his strongman persona to ease the tensions of and assert dominance over the communists. This Reagan administration would take things far further than anything we saw in our timeline. The East was shown that the West would tolerate these levels of aggression no more. Movements would be made to quell communistic influence spreading throughout Africa, and the Strategic Defense Initiative would be paraded around as the magnum opus of Reagan's administration. A system capable of ending the very concept of mutually assured destruction, that the US would no longer take any part in this what was essentially a suicide pact to not use nuclear weapons, and sought to make them obsolete. The Soviets and Chinese would be at a loss for words and action. This man sought to essentially neutralize the nuclear arsenals of the world, and in this timeline, with the added momentum of a military conquest and the greater threat the unified communist bloc posed, maximum effort would be funneled into getting this project up and running, and soon enough, it would be ready. 1984, the Strategic Defense Initiative would go live, and Reagan would put out a personal challenge to any aggressor to try and strike the US. For they would fail, and the US would be absolutely prepared to strike back. In essence saying, anyone who doesn't like us, take your best shot, but after that, we'll be putting you down for good. Neither the USSR nor China would take the risk, and just like that, 
Reagan had won the nuclear war that never came to be. The Cold War would come to an end, not a single warhead need be fired. If one was, it would make no difference. The US had won, the world's most powerful weapon made inert. Some would attempt to recreate their own strategic defense initiative, but even if they were successful, it would not change the fact that ICBMs had been made useless against the superpowers of the world. A period of tense peace would follow, no one daring to challenge the US, but eventually trouble would arise, conflicts that need to be fought by men and men alone. No risk of nuclear retaliation, no fear of global destruction, just plain old war. And that is where I'm going to end this video for now. Thank you all for watching, be sure to like the video if you enjoyed it, and subscribe for more. Mr. Z, out.